brand new episode of The Witching Hour. I am Perry, this is Haley, and today we're doing an episode with 12 Hour Shift writer-director Rhea Grant. Hello, hello. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. How's, uh, how's lockdown, lockdown life treating you? You know, it's pretty good. I, um, I have pets, which is like this... I think the pets in part like orchestrated lockdown because they <laughs> love that I'm home all the time and I'm fostering four kittens right now. So that's also been lockdown time. Oh, we are going to come back to that. Yeah. Okay, good. We're going to circle back. <laughs> we're going to save a chunk of the show for that. Um, <laughs> so 12 hour shift. I know it's been a little while since uh, Best Friends Forever, but you've been very busy in between. So I am wa- I'm wondering, is there any of the projects that you worked on in between that you found helping you the most as a director on this? Oh, wow. Um, everything. Because my first feature was the first thing I had written. I co-wrote it with Vera Meow. And, um, uh, and it was the first thing I'd ever directed. Um, so <laughs> since then, I've... You know, I mean, I learned a lot on that feature, but then I also learned things after that because I could reflect on what happened on the feature. And I think I was just a much, I was just much more aware of everything that went on on a set. Um, And I think after that feature, I did take a little bit of a break from writing and directing. And then at some point I was like, okay, I I know I want to write and direct. And um, what I did, which I had not done previous to that, was that I started writing every single day. I started moving towards writing and directing every single day. I mean, not, I mean, weekends included, I just, every day I have to do something to push that forward. And that, that was big for me because I think, um, you know, if you write every single day, you're going to get better. I mean, in spite of yourself, you will get better. And, um, uh, I started writing more and people started reading my stuff more and I got more feedback. So I definitely improved as a writer between my first, between best friends forever and 12 hour shift. Um, But also I just, I think, learned more about the film industry generally uh, just by being on more sets and using the knowledge I had gotten from doing Best Friends Forever. So it's just sort of a combination of all of those things. Whereas, and I'm also older, I'm in my late thirties now. So I'm just have much more experience and life experience to bring, I think. I'm much more chill on a set, I think, than my first one. (laughs) My first one, I was constantly panicked. (laughs) I am constantly panicked, but I don't show it. (laughs) That's fair. That's a difficult thing to kind of rein in and, you know, not wear your heart on your sleeve, especially when you're doing something like making a movie. Oh, for sure. I think, I think I, I mean, I, I probably shouldn't share this, but I called my boyfriend maybe like day three and he was like, I'm impressed it took you, I called him crying day three. Uh, and not on the set, but I was crying afterwards. And he was like, I'm surprised it took you this long to call. Cause I do wear my, my heart on my sleeve and I am a crier. And, um, you know, I, I learned learned to rein all that in for, by movie two. Well, it's kind of an interesting thing because being an actor to a certain extent requires you to wear your heart on a sleeve. It's a very different skill set than directing, maybe. Do you find that they are complementary in unexpected ways? Yeah, that is very astute that you said that because I was just talking about this the other day that I feel like I used to be a much more closed off person. I didn't start acting until my mid-20s and... Um, one thing that I think really helped me to open up and be a more open person is acting. I think I learned to express myself better and to understand my emotions and what I was going through a lot better. Um, But yeah, acting and directing just kind of feed into each other generally. I mean, if I'm a director and I'm losing my mind, I can always act like I'm not. (laughs) Um, And then with acting, I, I can see it from the director's perspective and I'm just much, like I said, I'm just much more able to know what's going on on a set. I'm, I'm not going to be the actor you bring in and complains about being there all day because I know what it's like to be a director and have your day go not the way you planned it. Just because I'm curious now, what what was the career trajectory before discovering acting? Uh, I was in graduate school. I have a master's degree in history. Um, and I was planning on being a, uh, a professor, I guess. I I sort of didn't know. I, I was... I was just floating along, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I was in graduate school and I was sucking. And I was very bad at graduate school. I had trouble speaking in my classes, like speaking up for myself. And um, I remembered I liked acting as a kid, like in local theater. And I took an acting class because I thought it would be nice for me, but also maybe it would help me speak up in my classes. And it did, but also like changed my life. So. <laughs> 
Great. What was your uh, your history area of focus? Um, in my undergraduate, it was sort of like late 18th century to 1920s. And I did a lot about um, like the 19, early 1900s anarchist movement. And then in uh, graduate school, I actually did pop culture studies within like America and sort of the world. Yeah. Very cool. I was a history major, so I was just kidding. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> It's more of like a take the required courses in history kind of person. But fair, enough. fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Listen, there's a path for everybody. <laughs> so when did the uh, draw to genre creep in? I've always liked genre. Um, when I was a kid, I liked it. I think um, I grew up at like the exact right time for like the 90s revival of horror. I was a teenager. So that that was really helpful. And then in my early 20s, I started reading comic books a lot and got really into comics. And so that kind of stuck with me. And if you're reading comics, you, yeah, it's definitely like a gateway drug to like horror movies and things like that. You just start to get into all this stuff. So, I mean, my love of it started then. And then I got cast in a bunch of genre stuff. And I don't know if it's my personality or the way I look. I don't know. But I just ended up kept in genre stuff. And once you're in that world, you kind of start, for me, I did a lot of research on the stuff I was doing. And then it was, I kind of became this like, self-feeding uh, universe, you know, where I was just, I was sort of always like doing genre and then partaking in genre and reading genre and watching genre and it all felt fed into itself. I wasn't I brushing to... you off. There's like a little net in my face. <laughs> <laughs> oh I man, always the best I time like to hear. <laughs> one of those genre projects you were in this year, because we are going to focus on 12 hour shift, obviously, but I, uh, I really enjoyed After Midnight, and it, it has still my favorite jump scare of the year so far. I just, it's a delight, and I think it's underwatched, and I wanted to send it a little love while we have you here. Please do, because I also love that movie. Um, and I'm not doing as much acting as I used to, but when I read that script that Jeremy Gardner wrote, I was like, I have to do this movie. I have to get this role. Like, I, I need to do it, because... I felt like I related to the character in so many ways. And I felt like she was a really, it's interesting because she's not in the whole, mo most of the movie, but you see so much of her. And I felt like he just really created this fully formed character that I, I don't know, just in, that I hadn't seen that much in, in films. And, um, and I got to do like a 10 minute monologue, which was also, you know, that's like an actor's dream. <laughs> and also our fear, but yeah. <laughs> I have one other non 12 hour shift question because you just brought up graphic novels and you are a director on the rise. Does directing a graphic novel comic book adaptation appeal to you at all? And is there anything in that sphere of the industry that you see people doing or companies doing that kind of excites you for that element of uh, movie making? Yeah, well, I'll plug right now that I have a graphic novel that I wrote coming out on October 4th. Um, it's called Mary. And um, I would definitely love to see that get made. But yeah, I'm, I, look, I'm at the comic book uh, release adaptations. At, I'm, I'm there on opening weekend. I love them all. Even the ones that are like kind of not great, I still love them. Like I, I, I find them really interesting. And I think just like playing in those universes of like extreme fantasy or extreme science fiction, you know, which is what those are, is really interesting to me. I love like heightened universes and I would love, I would absolutely love to do them. And I have so many pitches <laughs> for ones that haven't been made yet because there's a lot that have been made. And then there's some that I'm like, feel like very ripe for the making that haven't, haven't been made. And I'm here, Marvel, call me. I got ideas for X Factor. <laughs> Ooh, I feel like, like it's, it's on us. We got to start throwing your name on those, like, who should direct this next list? Please, because I actually think 12 Hour Shift is my sort of, like, you know, we made it for no money. Like, it's, it's a very low-budget film, but it is, like, it is, it, it has that comic booky feel. It is in that, like, fast-paced, quick-moving, like, we didn't even have a dolly and I'm like doing like crazy camera moves universe. Like that's kind of, I, I'm definitely taking some hints from that world. So speaking of financing that movie, I'm always curious when you take big swings and you go bold with something like this, like what is the key to making a pitch that convinces a financier to actually, you know, not only give you money to make your movie, but like believe in it and to be able to see what you want to do. Yeah, 
That's a great question, um, <laughs> which I feel like gets so many answers. Um, for me, I had the script written for 12 hour shift. Um, and because in some ways I am an unproven writer or definitely was when I, uh, when I sold that one, um, I had to have a really solid script and I've been working on it for a few years, trying to get it into a really good place. And, um, my financier read it, their independent financier. And, um, they were like, yeah, we want to make this. We like it as is. They didn't have any notes. They just were like, this is a really fast moving script. We, we read a lot of scripts that we don't think are that great. And, and this one kept us interested. So, I mean, I think having a script that's very unique is helpful, but also just having a script that's really tight. I think, I think, um, I, and I am definitely been guilty of this myself, but you're so excited to make your thing that you want to send it to people so quickly, but like make sure it's really good before you send it to someone because they're only going to read it the one time. And that's, uh, that's your shot. And you got to make sure you have a really a good, good like to stand on for that shot. That's, that's like solid actionable advice. I feel like <laughs> a lot of advice out there is like, you know, believe in yourself. Don't give up. That's that too, <laughs> you know, believe in yourself. Yeah. But half the time I don't believe in myself, you know? So I think like, yeah. I think for me, like having very, like, I know I have to get this script to this certain place. And when, you know, 10 people I trust have read it and they really like it or their notes are pretty minimal, I feel like it's okay. But the first few drafts of your script, don't send it to a financier because they are never going to read it again. Like that's, but I definitely did that early on when I first started writing. Was there ever um, like a back pocket, if I need to, I can act in this movie? Or did you very firmly only want to direct? Yeah, I, um, I had written the main character thinking I might want to play her and up until we were in pre-production I, I thought I was going to play the character Mandy which Angela about us ended up playing um but my first film again lessons learned um I acted and directed and um it was hard <laughs> and it's doable I uh, did it recently on a tv show I worked on um and I see people do it all the time really successfully but for me on 12 hour shift I just wanted to make sure I got all of the moving parts right and when we were in pre-production, I just kind of had the realization of how many moving parts there were and how much control I wanted over each little bit and each look and each move of the camera. And it's so hard to do when you're also, you know, in the case of 12 hour shift, like trying to get like your place within like your, your, uh, your drug needs, uh, you know, <laughs> happening or something like that. Um, so yeah, I, I knew I could always step into a role if I needed to, but, um, there's also just so many good actors out there who want to do good, good work and I know them. So I may as well call them up and have them do this thing that I don't necessarily want to do. Did you know David Arquette before this? No, he was on as a producer from the start. Um, so I met him through HCT Media, who was my production uh -huh. company. Um, so they brought him in and uh, we had dinner. We all had dinner. And that was pretty much it before he showed up to set. Um, and he read the script and was like, yeah, I'll, I'll do whatever. And so him and his wife came on and helped with the producing side of things. But also just, uh, yeah, having David Garquette in your movie is super helpful in getting people to see it. <laughs> I'm giving away our production calendar here, but we're having like a David Arquette day, filming day on Witching Hour. We were just talking Ooh. about him in our, in our last one, too. Oh, good. Oh, good. That's awesome for, um, for his documentary. Is that... No, uh -huh. not really. But we okay. the the site covered the documentary too, so we have that covered. We okay. were we might have been talking about uh, the Scream franchise in our previous uh, uh, Witching Hour, and I might have a cat named Deputy Dewey. We oh are my God. often inclined to talk about the Scream franchise. <laughs> I also love the Scream franchise, and I also love, even though like there are parts of it that are not great, but I also love the Buffy the Vampire Slayer uh, feature film, like movie, sure. and he's in that, and I forgot that he was in it until like the other day and I just shot a movie with him and I don't know why I didn't ask him questions about it but <laughs> yeah sort of he's been in everything so when you're acting on another director set are you just like in your acting zone or as a director yourself are you actively observing and kind of I don't know picking up other tools to add to your own toolbox yeah, or am I like standing behind monitor being like, I think you should move the camera. Um, <laughs> I'm definitely not doing that. Um, I try to 
uh, very much stay out of the directing thing while trying to understand what would make it easier for them. Um, like I'm aware of what makes it hard for a director as they're like putting their day together. And, you know, if I, and, and making sure I do all the things, like if I have questions, I don't ask them on the day. I try to get them in way earlier than that. Cause I know the director has a million things on their plate that day. Um, and I definitely pick up stuff. Like um, I acted in a movie right after 12 hour shifts called lucky, which I also wrote and Natasha Kamani directed it. And I learned a lot watching her just like what she's, she's a very calm force on set. And, has really strong opinions about certain things. And that is helpful for me to sort of take notes on as, as I'm watching. I mean, the thing about directing is it changes every single day. So I feel like I can always learn something by watching somebody. I like being on people's sets and seeing how they run them because it's usually really different than the way I would run a set. Um, but there's always things I can take away from that. And a, another just like tangent thing, because I knew Lucky sounded familiar when you just mentioned it. It was a, it was a South by selection this year, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, yeah. do you know what the, what the plan is for that? How was that for you guys kind of, you know, having that festival taken away? Yeah. Not only did I have that festival taken away, but 12 hour shift was supposed to premiere at Tribeca. And I found out a week later that that was also canceled. So I had a full on breakdown um, <laughs> one day. <laughs> it was pretty sad. And also just sad for all the people who worked on both of them. Um, so we all, we already had our tickets to go. I mean, South by Southwest was canceled pretty late. I was actually with the director when it got canceled um, and we got a text that was like South by Southwest has been canceled. And we just went straight to a bar and started drinking because we didn't know what else to do. We kept thinking it might get pushed or there were things that were going to happen. And then the full on cancellation was a real surprise to us. Um, yeah, it was a bummer. I, 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 but the movie is coming out. It got bought um, by Shutter, and it comes out on Shutter next year, which is great. Um, that's a pretty happy ending. It, so another thing that we're obsessed with, in addition to David Arquette, is Shudder. <laughs> oh, cool. Go, go, go. Yeah, I love them as well. And it's, and it's playing, like, like 12 Hour Shift, it's playing a bunch of virtual festivals. It's actually playing um, Nightstream, that festival that's coming up, which is really seems like a cool, cool thing that's happening. Cool. All those festivals got together and did, like, an online thing. So Lucky's playing that one, which would be cool. And add those to our, our list of things that we're big fans of. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Um, I'm curious about the the approach to writing these characters coming from an actor's point of view, because I felt that every character, no matter how small, I could see why an actor would want to take that role. Like, even though David Arquette doesn't have the biggest role in the film, I was like, that's a really interesting character who doesn't actually say that much, but you have a whole sense of this being. And I, I, I guess just like, do you... Do you try to write two roles that you would want to take? And if so, what does that mean to you as a writer? First of all, I have to ask you a question. Are you on the floor right now? Are you like, on the floor? <laughs> the desk. Oh, oh, it's just like, it's a desk that's really high. Okay. Like, it's like, I, I will never be able to unsee that. I wish it I was that feels... groovy, just like chilling like out. <laughs> you know, I do a lot of work on the floor. Like I love to spread out all over a carpet and I, developed that in college and I was telling one of my college friends the other, the other day and they were like you still do that and I was like I do I've never given up this literally anyway sorry that was just like a moment where I was like is she sitting like cross-legged on the floor no like no a visual trick I can't I'm you know sorry. what I'm picturing right now? You were what was what's the the horror installation with the Beetlejuice section and like I sat in the couch and it was just the top of my body. I like scary movies. Yeah 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 I love yes. scary movies. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Uh, yes, acting. Uh, <laughs> developing characters. Um, yes, I, so when I'm writing, um, like, maybe to a fault, I'm writing from a character perspective, um, to, the, to the point where I will write full scripts from a character perspective and realize I need to go back and add story. Um, it's, I think that is that acting background that just, I have always, you know, started from an, a, the point of a character and then expanded out. And that sort of is where all of my characters come from as well. But I have to give a lot of credit to my actors on the movie because I, I talked to all of them before they came. Some of them I knew, especially people playing more supporting roles. I knew them really well, like Tom Petrinus or um, Kit Williamson, um, Tommy Hobson. Like a lot of those people I already had worked with in the past. Um, Brooke Sagan being the person I've worked with a lot, actually. Um, and I... I met with all of them and was like, 
we got to give your character a backstory and make sure we know like where you are throughout the night. Like, where is your character? What is driving your character? And if at any point in the film, we decided, oh, we're going to go with these main characters anymore. We're going to go with this like random guy who found a stack of organs. Like, I want to know what your story is and where you were throughout the night. And so we made sure we were really specific about where they were and what everything about them, which really helped with the filmmaking uh, overall. But also those actors are just so good at building out these backstories and coming with really strong character choices. Um, it's just kind of a combination of all of those things, find it, finding those, those characters. It almost like makes me really think like there could be other there could be other movies or like spinoffs like alt uh, alt perspectives of this night's <laughs> events. <laughs> that was the idea that like throughout the night, like at any point in time, you could go with um, like Tara Perry played the redheaded um, a nurse. Like, but she's doing stuff throughout the night. She has plans. She's very busy. And like, what is her story throughout that evening? Um, and they're all a lot of those actors are also improvisers, and we did a lot of improv on set. And that just helps to build the character because they are thinking about the funny things they're going to say or things that are specific to their character. Before we leave characters, I wanted to address Regina, who has to be one of my favorite character, female characters specifically. Like, I hate to specify it, but women don't tend to get these types of roles as often. Um, and I was just captivated, repulsed, annoyed, couldn't look away, charmed. Like, what a fascinating creation. And uh, I'm curious your experience of working with the actress to nail that character, the walking the line between pushing the repulsive angles of her without totally alienating the audience because she is captivating and the worst. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I wanted her to be frustrating. And, and I do think when I was writing her, I was actually trying to write her as like a true psychopath, like, like that she had no more remorse and she thought everything she did was a good idea. Like everything should feel like a good idea. And um, I had a lot of trouble casting the role. There were, uh, I, I saw a lot of people for it. A lot of people had really good takes and I think their takes were all really based on the material. Like I think the character was really dark in the script. But then Chloe Farnworth came along and she just did this thing where she was so kind of like naive about everything. Like everything just felt like no, this is the right decision. Like I'm doing the right thing at this moment. And I was like, oh, that's the character. The character is a, is a woman who doesn't even understand what she's doing is wrong. And that made her far more interesting than a person who was, had just a lot of self-awareness. Like she had zero self-awareness. And um, Chloe's tape was so amazing. Uh, she's, she's British and she, she, she didn't quite nail the accent the first time. And I was like, I don't care. Like, I don't care what, she, we, we'll figure the accent out on the day. Like, I can do a Southern accent. I can help her with this. And, um, but I did insist on meeting her because I was kind of scared that she might be an actual psychopath because her tape was so believable. Like, I, I was like, this tape is so, I mean, I was like, she could actually not have any remorse for anything. But then I met her and she was super, she's a super nice lady and really sweet and very mature and like, just super nice and uh and it ended up working out really well and I, she was such a dream to work with i feel like something that we say often on this show are, is that some of the best genre filmmakers and you just the people who could really tap into that kind of craziness are often the most lovely people you are ever going to meet in your life i totally think so i think especially with genre people we are we're getting our darkness out on screen. We're, we're working through our demons. We're like watching our demons when we watch horror movies. Like we're able to like work through a lot of that crap. Whereas like the darkest people you meet are comedians. Like those are the people who you should watch out for. It's like, don't, I dated way too many improvisers early on when I moved to LA. Like don't date improv people. <laughs> I'm going to get people angry about that. But. <laughs> Speaking speaking of the improv, though, because you brought up that you had a lot of great improvisers on this set, if you were to name one person who would just, I guess, catch you off guard the most with, I don't know, how big they might go with something, who would you pick and why? Wow. So many of them are, like, actually great improvisers. Tara Perry and Brooke Sagan are on an improv team together, and they're both really good. But I have to say Tom Detrinis is the person that will have you giggling hysterically behind camera and he is the guy who finds the bag of organs the beginning middle and end and he only comes in for a little bit but he just has such a strong screen presence and would just say things that we all would just be like cracking up about god i mean they were all really good because nikia gamby turner is also 
really good at improvising would just every scene she would just give a button to to the point where I was like I can't I can't use all of her buttons because every time she would say something really funny at the end of every single take yeah they're all just like really smart good improvisers how do you approach hitting uh, a let's say reasonable time balance when you know you have to hit schedule but you want to give your cast room to do that thing they're so great at yeah, well, because this was an indie and we could kind of do it how we wanted, um, we knew from the very beginning that every take I wanted to have an actor take where they could do an improv, do some improv and kind of play with the script and do whatever they wanted. Um, I learned that on a show. I worked on a show called Eastsiders for, um, there were four seasons and I worked on all four seasons, starting as an actor and building to being a, a writer director on that show. And um, that was something that the showrunner, Kit Williamson, who's actually in 12 hour shift playing the cop, um, he always did for all of his actors at the end of every, every take, he'd be like, okay, actor take, throw out the script, do whatever you want. And I, I just kind of implemented the same thing really early on 12 hour shift, like letting the actors know they're going to get to improvise, which is good because like, it means that they can do their own thing if they don't like the direction I've been giving them. And it takes time but not as much time as reshooting a scene that doesn't work. So <laughs> for me, it's a lot of the actors finding the scene, but also, um, you know, giving me stuff that I can use in the edit room that I might not, that is not in the script. Cause I think I'm a good writer. I think there's still things missing from every scene that we can find on the day. And I like that. I like the nature of like discovering things in the moment. That's really exciting for me. And I will, I, I can't imagine a point in my career where I won't want people to improv to some extent. I'm curious about pulling all of this off on a limited budget. First, how, how did you find that location and, and what is it? Is it a, a non-operational hospital? It's an operational hospital. <laughs> <laughs> um, every other floor was, work, was a working hospital except for our floor, um, which leads to some comedic and dark moments, as you might imagine. Um, uh, my producers are from Arkansas and um, Tara Perry at, uh, told her dad about this script. He lives in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Shout out to John Perry. And he was like, I think I know a hospital that they're about to redo a floor, but it hasn't been updated since the 90s. Let's like see if it's available. And it was. And this is the weird thing about shooting in a place like Arkansas. We were just like, can we shoot a movie here? And they were like, yeah, you can shoot a movie here. <laughs> um, so we, we did before they updated it, they were about to renovate and they didn't renovate them um, before we shot the movie. So that was huge because, you know, you couldn't shoot that in LA. We wouldn't be able to afford a location like that on the budget that we made this movie for. Well, most certainly wouldn't be free in LA. <laughs> Would not be free. And then the other thing is like, you know, it's set in the nineties. So we needed all this nineties equipment. And um, the hospital was like, well, we got this old storage shed full of equipment. And we were like, yeah, can we look through that? And then we did and like, the entire movie is dressed with stuff from that and from like the local Goodwill basically. Because we couldn't really rent that many props and there was nowhere to rent them from in uh, Arkansas. So um, we, we kind of like just went through everything the hospital had to offer and then dressed all of, all of the locations, the various rooms with that. That being said, we had to move a lot of stuff. We only had a certain number of beds. So, like, you're seeing the same beds over and over again. You just don't know because we've moved them. Like, you're seeing the same hallway over and over again. Uh, the same locations are being used repeatedly throughout the film. So, with so, a know, limited amount of things, sorry, Haley, just a quick follow-up. Limited amount of things, but a lot of blood. So, how restrictive is that so that you don't ruin your limited things? Well, fortunately, most of the blood was on the nurses' costumes. And so nurses' costumes, you can actually get a lot of those. They are a really specific cut, the nurses' costumes, because in the 90s, they were much boxier than nurses now have, like, you know, slimmer fit. Like, they're, like, a little, you know, hipper now. Um, so that was the only thing is we had to make sure we had, like, that limited amount. But we're in a hospital, so we also had access to a washer-dryer all of the time. <laughs> so we could wash things really easily. Um, so yeah, the, the continuity issues were not, it wasn't a huge problem because the, the costumes were fairly cheap for the most part. My question was pretty goofy, but, uh, Please. you know, how, if you're filming in Burbank, you have to pause every few minutes for a plane. What is it that if you're filming in an active hospital, you have to, is it sirens? What's the problem? 
No, actually, we couldn't hear any sirens. But um, what we were pausing for a lot was random people wanting to come to set. <laughs> because when you're shooting in a small town, uh, people find out you're shooting and they just like go up to that floor of the hospital and they'll just roll, roll into your set and be like, I heard you're shooting a movie. And we're like, yes can we help you with something? And what usually ended up happening is that Jordan, my producer would be like, yes, would you like to be in the background? We need you for two hours. And people would be like, yeah. And so like all of our background is like various people from the hospital or from the gas station that like saw David Arquette and then he invited to the set. That that happened quite a bit where they would just show up to set and we'd throw them in the background somewhere. And so that was the major interruption we would have up with. It kind of sounds like this was all very meant to be. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You know, we got so fortunate with a lot of things. I mean, without that location, you couldn't make this movie and not, not on this budget. It would have to be a much more expensive movie. Um, and we couldn't have made it when we made it. We would have had to do a lot more time trying to find someone to finance the movie for a lot of money. Just because it's on my mind, because we asked it earlier, we play a would you rather filmmaking game every so often. Would you rather have enough time, but not enough money or enough money, but not enough time? Um, enough. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I would rather have enough time, but not enough money because even on this film, like I didn't have enough time. I didn't get everything I wanted, but it's the very, but I had more time than probably a lot of people would on these size budgets. Uh, uh, for lucky, for example, we shot that in 15 days and on this one I had 18. It's still not enough time, but it's way more time than like, uh, then, you know, some, some movies get, you know, I've heard of movies shooting for like 10 days now. And at the very least, like you can make the mistakes and be able to correct them. But if you have no more time, all the money in the world can't, can't buy you more time. I mean, I guess it could if you put the money there. I don't know. It's a very hard question. Actually. I feel like that's the only, that is the only instance where people actually choose money is if they want to cheat at my game. And they're like, well, if I had more money, I could buy more I time. would buy more days. Right. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you're saying I can't have more days, I only have money, then all the money in the world isn't going to be able to, I mean, you can have, because I mean, on a set like this, we had a really, really small crew. Like whatever you're picturing, divide it by five. Um, <laughs> uh, but I've been on sets that have, you know, a crew of like 50 to 100 people. Uh, like when I work on television or something, you have like a huge crew, but that doesn't mean that you're running quicker. And sometimes it actually means you're running uh, uh, slower. So what about the just genesis of the idea in general? Because obviously this is very heightened, but I was wondering if you learned anything about the behind the scenes of what it means to be a nurse that might have influenced some of the things we see happen in the movie. Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, my brother is a nurse and I have nurses in my family. So there's definitely some, some of it coming from that. Um, and I have spent like some time in hospitals because I'm an elderly father. So there was some of, some of that was in there as well. Um, so there's definitely some real life influences, but I'm, I'm clearly pushing that. Um, as far as like what happens. So because we're in a working hospital, we made friends with a lot of the nurses that worked there and they would come up on their breaks and we were able to use them for like everything we needed where we're like, oh no, is this how you, how do you intubate somebody? How do you, how do you put a thing? Like we would just like ask them these questions. So I, I weirdly learned a lot about nursing and a lot about um, uh, like how to do things in a hospital and, and procedures and standards for the 90s. I mean, we, this was a period piece, so we tried to keep it true to that. But yeah, just being around nurses, you start to pick up on stuff, but they're just heroes. And I, I know nothing and feel like such a useless schmuck when it comes to all this stuff. <laughs> um, what was sort of the motivation to put it in the 90s because you do to a certain extent immediately write yourself into a harder set decorating a harder costuming that kind of situation yeah a harder set but an easier heist movie so because <laughs> i think like the downfall with a lot of heist movies is that you're like oh just text them and tell them that something went wrong you know and that can't you couldn't do that which was helpful in writing but um i'm a child of the 90s so for me writing about like a small town in the South in the nineties, which is where I'm from and where I spent the nineties. It made sense to me to have, it all kind of fed into each other. Like from my very, very subjective point of view, like the nineties exists in a very particular place and time for me, obviously time. Uh, and, and so I just kind of used 
the location and the space that I knew and I remembered from the 90s um, uh, and, and in the 90s. So it all, it all is very subjective, I guess. Like that's the world I, I knew in the 90s. Did you find it ever a struggle to like separate nostalgia from what you were trying to do in the film or did you maybe lean into nostalgia? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely things that I am nostalgic about that probably made their way into the movie. And there, and it's a heightened movie. Like, obviously, there's, uh, you know, like the talk of Y2K and all this kind of stuff is, it, it gives it sort of a heightened sense of space and time, I think. Um, but I didn't, I mean, I did want like a, ni- a big like 90s song for the movie and we couldn't afford it. And that actually probably was better because I think it was just for nostalgic reasons. I don't think I actually needed it to show anything in the movie. I don't think it would have added anything to the movie. We, we were, there was a hot minute where um, there's a dancing sequence where he's dancing down the hallway and um, we were trying to get the song Push It because that's what he's actually dancing to like on the day. We had like Salt and Peppa's Push It. Um, and I and we, we actually got like the prize and we're like, okay, we could possibly do it. But I actually felt like it took you out of the movie to add a 90s song into it. Mm-hmm. Well, I good. already told you, I, I adore that sequence. So <laughs> I, I think you made all the right choices. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Just going back to the nursing element of it, and again, it being heightened, how do you figure out the appropriate balance between, you know, expressing your reverence for what nurses do, but also, like, leaning into this idea of nurses having this ar- this organ harvesting operation going? Right. And also being, like, kind of bitchy about the whole thing. Like, they're all just, like, kind of over it. There was one point where there was a nurse there with me, and I was like, is she too harsh? Like in this moment, and the nurse was like, she's not harsh enough. And I was like, okay. <laughs> At least I know I'm being like the tone from, from the nurse's perspective, correct. Um, and yeah, I mean, look, it's a dark comedy. It's supposed to be funny. I wanted to lean into the funniness of it. I wanted people to laugh. I wanted people to walk away like laughing. But like, I also wanted to like show my appreciation that this is like a really tough job. And that's why the movie ends a spoiler. Uh, it's not much of a spoiler. The movie ends with like, it's a shift job. She literally has to go back to another shift after going through this horrible shift all night long. And I wanted to show that, that this is, it is a difficult, you know, blue collar in many ways job where you have to go and show up and it's shift work, you know, and that's, and that's tough. And yet we rely on these people for like our entire lives And I think the nice thing about the nice thing, one thing to come out of COVID that is nice is that we all suddenly have like appreciation for these frontline workers, right? But, um, you know, it's sad that it took a, a, you know, a pandemic for us to realize how much work they were doing. That that is definitely the case. But uh, bringing up the pandemic, I do want to add one thing to what we were talking about earlier with the festivals being canceled. Just so you know, like this has come up a number of times on Witching Hour don't be too bummed about the festivals and the theatrical opportunities going away because I feel like movies coming out at home are encouraging people to watch things that they might not have otherwise. And for people who are in lockdown with families to share those movies with other people. So I feel like if there's any silver lining to releasing a movie during the pandemic, it might be that. Yeah, and then also, I mean, it's interesting because I feel like there's a lot of people who can't go to festivals for whatever reason, financial reasons, or or just locations of where they are. And it's been interesting because you can go to them now, like some of them, like Fantasia Film Festival, where uh, we won Best Screenplay. Um, We played there, and everyone in Canada got to see the movie if they wanted to, which we normally couldn't travel. And then there's been a few in the States, uh, we're playing even more in the States, Um, And it's like, it just kind of opened it up to people who can't normally go to festivals. And that was, I don't know, it was rad. It was rad to me to see like this democratization of like the festival viewing experience, because normally it is really limited to 200 people who can afford it. Mm -hmm. Has, Has being in lockdown inspired you to create more like while we're in this position and maybe to embrace other forms of I don't know, technology or storytelling than you might have otherwise? Yes. <laughs> yes and no. I mean, there are days I think, like everyone, I'm very not inspired by anything. Um, but I write every day and I just continued that into lo- lockdown. Like we were like, we're going into lockdown. I still get up and start my day by writing with the pages that I need to write. And, uh, you know, even if it's not on, at, on a deadline or anything, I write every single day just to 
that's what I do. I am a writer and whether or not someone's paying for me, I'm going to continue to do that. So I continued on that schedule. It's probably changed like what I want to be writing. Um, I was writing, when lockdown started, I was trying to write this post-apocalyptic movie that took place after a pandemic. And I was like, I, I can't write this anymore. <laughs> like it's, it's not, it's too real. I want to write like a comedy or something fun. Um, and then right now I'm trying to experiment with writing a narrative podcast because I have the means to record that. I know people who can do it from home and it's a storytelling medium I haven't really gotten to play in. And um, it's something we can all just do. And I can employ my rad writer, rad um, actor friends from the comfort of their own home. I love the sound of that. <laughs> Absolutely. I do. It's, you know, to a certain extent, you don't want to find the silver lining in a pandemic because that feels weird. But uh, it, it has been refreshing to watch people explore their creativity in different means, different ways, and, and kind of taking us back to, or at least for me, like, well, what would I have done with my friends when I was a kid that we could have done because we had the stuff? And how can I translate that to, like, a real thing you can do now? It yeah, yeah. And, like, this is, like, weird, but I just have all these friends from college, and we talk pretty often, but not that often, but something about the pandemic made us talk more. So then we started, we like, you know, now we talk every, every Saturday, like all these girls I knew in college and we were like in a college feminist group together. And like, you know, our lives have gone different ways. They all have families and uh, careers and things. And so we get to actually chat every weekend and taking that time is a direct response to the pandemic. Like, which is such a weird response, but that that's kind of what we've done. And it's been a nice refresher on like who I am and like uh who these people are who were really important to my life so I'm in so many slacks now and I don't I so don't many slacks love it. all the all the Marco Polo like the Marco Polo like we got really into it all of my friends got into Marco Polo for a hot minute and, nice yeah <laughs> the the slacks and uh virtual beer pong is a thing and now it's the, the Friday night tradition and I get to see so many friends' faces regularly, which I wasn't even doing when I was physically in LA, able to see them whenever I wanted. No, no totally. And like, um, I play D and D every week, and I oh, I have for a while, but we had to move online. And now I have there's people who have joined our group from like New York, Austin, like we all like all these people that we know we've never obviously been able to play with us in real life. They actually get to play with us, which has been really cool. I'm holding tight to all those positives right now. I'll take whatever I can get to push through this. Well, I'm everything. Right. It might not be as positive, and I'd hate to uh, bring the mood down, but what has your experience been trying to work on future projects from this perspective? Have, have the meetings translated as well to these new mediums? Is that going smoothly or not so much? Um, yes and no. I mean, I guess the weird thing is I don't have a reference point for it outside of this, right? Like I pretty sure, I'm pretty sure I'm the only writer who had a project both at South by Southwest and Tribeca this year. Um, uh, Cause tri 12 hour shift was a Tribeca film and uh, Lucky was a South by Southwest film. And I was like, Oh cool. I'm just going to like get all these meetings. They're going to, I'm going to get hired to write something. And that has not happened. It is not translated in the way that I kind of wanted it to, but other things have come out of it that I think are really interesting. So I don't know. It's cool. I mean, the zoom meetings are interesting <laughs> not to get like technical about it, but I kind of like not driving to Santa Monica at like 5 PM. Like there's something nice about that. Y'all you know, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I have no reference point, so I have no idea. Like if, the pandemic and all of this has actually changed the way it's definitely changed the way the industry is working but not maybe it'll be more positive in the long run I have no idea hmm. you could I from our perspective at least I'll only speak for myself I have found that a lot of interview subjects are more open or relaxed because they're at home um, hmm. it definitely has changed the game in certain ways from like the media standpoint, not, not just the relief of not having to go to Beverly Hills and things like that, but really people seem yeah. calmer and more willing to talk for longer times. Yeah. Cause what are we doing? I mean, like, <laughs> it's weird if we're not, and like we're at home, you know, and I'm with like my dog and I can like go and take, eat a snack. And like, it's like way less stressful than being stuck in my car all day, driving from meeting to meeting. Um, which is what my life kind of used to be. 
Speaking of a dog, should we like, do it? Like that no, I'm, I'm going to give it to you, Haley, because I feel like I steal that, that fun question from you too often. No, it's okay. I just meant, I know Perry's not going to pass on that. Perfect no, I'm not. <laughs> um, we do always love to ask our, our guests if they have pets, but you already told us. So I will now ask you to tell us about your pets. Oh, wow. Wow. This is so I kind of run the house for wayward pets over here. Um, I have a dog that was a foster fail. His name is Birthday Party. Um, and she's 14. Uh, she well, I'm so shocked she hasn't wandered in here yet. Um, and then we have two cats, one we got during quarantine, just recently, the other one we've had for a long time. And they're both Persians and their names are Malachi and Lucy. And um, they're both old also. Like, I, we lo I love an elderly pet. Like, I, I love how over it they are, how they just are kind of, like, not willing to tolerate any BS. Like, they're just totally, they're just so funny to me that I keep adopting these old, old pets. <laughs> and I really like them. They're so cute. They're so cute. And they're so kind of grumpy. And, like, there's nothing funnier than, like, we just adopted the 16-year-old Persian cat. And, um... She's so grumpy looking all the time, and it's very funny. Like, because she's just kind of like, you pick her up, and she's like, Rah! like, it's just so hilarious to me. I don't know. Um, and, um, and then I'm fostering four little baby kittens right now. Oh, my goodness. That's, like, yeah. the best full house to have. It's, it's entirely too much. I, I timed it the other day, and it takes me 40 minutes to feed them all and take care of them in the morning because they're all separate and have separate – they all are special needs. They all have, like, very specific medications that they're on and they need, and the kittens have to be weighed. Have you ever tried to weigh a kitten? It's insane. We, we do the thing with our pets where we'll get on the scale first and oh. get our weight, and then we'll pull the pet and get on the scale. Someone the other day was like, why don't you put like a bowl on the scale and then put them in the bowl? But I, I kind of have a, a system going where I'm just kind of like estimated and they seem, <laughs> they seem to tolerate that. But, um, but shout out if you're in Los Angeles area, I um, fostered through Angel City Pit Bulls. They have a whole kitten fostering program and they always need more people. So if you're looking to foster, it's a great program. They can give you the food, they give you the litter, they give you everything you need. And then you have these adorable kittens like running around your house causing mayhem. Great. I feel like I'm like making a mental list of people to tell that to now. Please, because they do need people and they're really nice and um and they they answer all my crazy text questions where I'm like, is this kitten dying? And like, no, the kittens are fine. Like they're <laughs> they're very nice to me. Adopt animals. Adopt yes. animals. Yes. Yeah. So we always ask that question and we also always ask our guests, what is something in genre that you've discovered recently that you want to share with everyone, whether it's a podcast, a movie, a TV show, it could be old, new, anything at all. Hmm, that is a really good question. I just did a rewatch of Dark City. Do you remember this movie, Dark City from like the 90s? It's great and holds up in it like the visuals hold up in this way that I was not expecting. I thought it was going to look corny and it looks amazing. So like, it's like, I would like to see more movies that have that kind of like noir sci-fi look, I guess like that, that I watched it yesterday. I was just kind of blown away. And then I just started watching a series. I started watching a couple of series. Um, this is not exactly genre, but pen 15 is worth watching. If you, if people are not watching it, it's, Maybe the best show on television. Um, <laughs> and I also started watching Brave New World on Peacock. And it is a fantastic science fiction. Um, I realize none of these are horror that I just named. But um, it's, it's a fantastic like science fiction uh, series about a world in which there is no privacy, no monogamy, and no something else. And everyone is on these specific drugs. It's pretty fun. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. That sounds like it could be pretty horror adjacent, though. <laughs> It's definitely horror adjacent, and it's based on, like, the 1930s book, but they moved it into, like, modern day. It's really, it's really cool. I, I thought it was really rad. I'm trying to think of something, like, straight-up horror. I have watched some straight-up horror stuff lately, but I... We try to offer a warm embrace to all genre here on The Witching Hour. Oh, that, that's like, cool. that's also why we always say genre and not horror, because I feel oh, like it, it's such a knee-jerk reaction to box horror into, like, the tiniest box imaginable, and it's so... Yeah. Like, and I feel like I live in the horror adjacent world in a lot of ways. Like the stuff I create is not exactly horror. And I kind of like that, that the horror community embraces me, even though it's 
you know, Twelve Hour Shift is much more of a dark comedy, I think, but it has all these horror elements in it. Do y'all want to know the best? One of the best movies I've seen this year is a movie called Jumbo, and it's horror. It's it's genre adjacent, and it is about a girl who falls in love with a um uh, uh a carnival ride, a carnival ride. Okay. Yeah, the look on both of your faces. Let me just tell you right now, <laughs> best movie I've seen this year. <laughs> I was intrigued. so moved. I was crying by the end. She falls in love with the carnival ride. And it, it is so believable. I think it's French. I saw it at a film festival, an online film festival. And it is just to die for. This was another Sundance one. I knew this sounded familiar. It's so good, Jumbo. If you get a chance uh, to see that. I think it's playing a lot of festivals still. And hopefully it'll be out in the States at some point. Put it in my notes mm-hmm. right now. I know. Mm-hmm. I have so much homework to do. And I love it. <laughs> It's gotta, you gotta, you gotta watch that. And then if you have Shutter, I actually thought that there's a movie called The Beach House on Shutter that kind of blew me away. Ah, yes, um, yes, we know The Beach House. Yeah, that's a fun one. There, there's a lot of good stuff to be watching right now, including Twelve Hour Shift. So, Rio, we have to send you a huge thank you for joining us today. For everybody out there who has not seen 12 Hour Shift, it's available in select theaters and on demand October 2nd. So go check it out. Bria, do you have, um, I know you said you're off Twitter. So you're on Instagram? I am on Instagram. It's my name, uh, Bria Grant. And 12 Hour Shift has an Instagram that's just 12 Hour Shift film maybe I, you'll find it it's just search for it <laughs> and, and we have like all these like gifts and stickers that someone made so that's always really exciting oh that's fun we need to make sure there's 12 hour shift in our uh, slack giphy Haley. Yes, please yeah. do very important um Haley, where can everyone find you on the internets i am not as smart as our lovely guests so you can find me on twitter <laughs> at Haley fouch and you can find me on instagram at haystack mcgroovy and i'm at p off on twitter and instagram That is it. Bria, again, thank you so much for joining us. To everyone out there, you have officially survived the witching hour.